excuse me for not standing, but I can't. But um, my question is this, that uh, we're going to have millions of unemployed, and we're going to have millions of new jobs uh, working on the infrastructure. And uh, there's going to be a disconnect in skills between those two groups. Mm -hmm. To what extent are educational institutions living up to bridge that gap? Sure. This is very important, this mismatch between skill sets and what the new jobs are going to be. Though I do think that there's a lot of transferability that maybe people don't realize. Uh, we'll see how it, how, it, how it works out. I know that in our state, the community college has been very active about trying to put programs into place to bring people rapidly up to speed who've been laid off in a new skill. Certainly our branch campuses at Flint and Dearborn have worked hard about having people who say have been laid off at one of the auto companies to come and get retooled so that they can work in a new area. And so I think we're going to see more and more of that. Clearly, as the need exists, institutions, at least in our state, seem to be stepping up. Uh, Ann Arbor, not so much because uh, we are a more traditional uh, you know, un undergraduate population of young age. Though, I will tell you that when the Pfizer property, uh, when Pfizer decided to pull out of Ann Arbor and we had all these uh, wonderful scientists and all these people who were perhaps at the end of their scientific career but didn't want to give up working, didn't want to move to some other place uh, with Pfizer, we opened a whole new program in our education school on a dime to train people who wanted to go into public school teaching who were scientists and maybe wanted to have a new career. So if the challenge is there, at least our institution has shown in a way that we can step up and create a program for people if they'd like to take advantage of it. But it's an important point, and I think we'll be seeing more institutions trying to do that. Dr. Coleman, I, I noticed in, your, in the brochure that was passed out to us that one of the initiatives you are undertaking is something called Ethics in Society. Mm -hmm. I wish that you would elaborate upon that a little bit, considering the fact that perhaps some of our difficulties in this country, many of them perhaps, stem back to an understanding, a, a limited understanding of ethical behavior. Um, I'd also be interested to know whether what you're hoping to do is an elective course or something that's going to be ingrained through the university. We uh, initiated this program about four years ago, and uh, one of the reasons that I decided to put a focus on it is because I've had many students come to me. I hold uh, sort of informal meetings once a month with students. We call them the fireside chats. And anybody can come and they can talk to me about any issue that they'd like to talk about. And I just heard this undercurrent, this, this how do we deal with new media, with YouTube, with being exposed in a way in a digital environment? This is from the student's mind. And so I put some money aside so that we could uh, start some programs to see how this would develop. I, I wasn't quite sure about what would happen, but I wanted to test the waters. So we did two things. Number one, we uh, put some money up for competition in the provost office to ask teams of faculty to come together and propose courses that could be taught specifically to first and second year students that would grapple with ethical issues. Because if you're not a philosophy major, you know, this is a diff you, you do have to have an intellectual background. I mean, you need to know something in order to make some of these tough choices. Sometimes ethical choices are not easy. And so we had some really good course proposals that got developed for teaching hundreds of students. So I thought that was a real positive. The other thing that we did then is we held for a couple of years, once a month, fora that we, we didn't want the topic to be known too far in advance. We wanted people to, to take the topics from the headlines and be able to put together a forum so that students could come, townspeople could come, faculty could, could come to talk about it, an issue that was in the headlines in the previous few weeks. So we did that for a couple of years, and that was really interesting. I participated in, I couldn't go to all of them, but I participated in a few of them. And they were tough. I mean, th these students are grappling with, with issues that you and I would have trouble dealing with. And so I found those to be really quite valuable. Uh, we're not doing those anymore because I don't, I don't want it to become so routine that it's just, oh, I have to go to this or whatever. So we tried it, worked, it was really good. We got some good issues on the table. We've now hired a director uh, for the center 
on ethics in public life. And uh, he's just getting underway. We made his appointment official this last semester. And uh, we're going to be trying to add some faculty, create some courses. It won't be mandatory, because I've discovered that doing things that are mandatory is, you know, it, it, you have to want to do it. But I want to, I want to have a place that students can, can get some real knowledge that help them construct a moral center that they can make decisions. And, you know, this isn't just as easy as saying, don't do wrong. I mean, you have to have a basis upon which to do it. And so what I suspect we'll have is a larger number of course offerings. And students have been flocking to these courses. They care deeply about these issues. It's troubling to them. The governor of Ohio, in his budget proposal this past week, proposed a freeze on college university <laughs> tuitions for the next several years to avoid the escalating costs of uh, higher education, which imposes a burden on the family and the students. To what extent is this a concern of university administration, and what can be done about it to control these escalating costs in the future? I think the other thing that the governor of Ohio, propo Ohio proposed, which is a key part of that uh, uh, suggestion, is that the state would make up the difference and would give the universities a 5% increase in their budget to make it happen. Um, so I believe that clearly uh, keeping the cost of education affordable, whether you do it through lowering tuition for everybody or you have more financial aid, you accomplish the same thing for families. And so at Michigan, ever since I've been at Michigan since 2002, we have received a reduction in our budget. So let me just give you some figures so you understand what I'm dealing with. When I came to the University of Michigan in 2002, our state allocation was $365 million. Last year it was $320 million. And I, I don't have any way to make it up except for tuition and for more uh, uh, donor support, more philanthropy, more research support. I'm trying to maximize all of those. During that period, every time we've increased tuition, we've increased financial aid far more. We've eliminated a lot of loans for our lowest income families. We've created more grants. If you come to the University of Michigan, you know, depending on your circumstance number of children in the family and you make an income of around sixty to seventy thousand dollars, you will leave college with no debt. We will make it all up for you. And so we've worked hard to make it possible. But for me, there is no sustainable model in decreasing state support and freezing tuition. That's not a sustainable model. And so I'm trying to do my best in a tough circumstances. I know my colleagues are as well. And we, in addition, I, 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 don't wanna, I wanna make this point because I make it every time. Every time we start our budget, we take 25 million out of the base in, in efficiencies. Since I've been at Michigan, we've removed over $135 million from the base just by consolidating activities, becoming more efficient, getting rid of things that were no longer productive. Because I can't build a budget without just absolutely putting that savings in. And we're used to it. We do it every year. Uh, I have never met uh, any unenthusiastic alumni <laughs> from the University of Michigan. <laughs> including the son and those that don't, that advocate, what differentiates the University of Michigan, a large university, with other large universities in that respect? Well, you know, I, all of us, all of us who are presidents, and I know my colleagues in the room would, uh, would agree, is that all of us work very, very hard to make the experience one that is memorable for students. When they come in, they know that we care about them. Um, you know, we, I, I could make an education at Michigan cheaper. I could make the classes bigger. I could hire more adjunct professors. I could not have all of the sort of social, social service, the mental health services we have for patients. All, we have a thousand student activities, a thousand student clubs. We, you know, this, this thousand pitches that I told you about is a student club called Empowered. It costs money to do it, but it creates a kind of connectiveness and loyalty to the institution with people who know, they know we care. 